This is the first lecture of complex analysis, and today we're going to talk about the construction and the topology of the complex set. And complex analysis is basically analyzing its analysis with complex variables. And unlike real analysis, like we when we're analyzing complex variables, many things will become geometric. So it's more geometric than analytic than real analysis. So we have to talk about some topology on it. It is necessary. And let's just start with the construction of the complex set. Okay, so let's just start. So C is defined to be Cartesian product of reals, two reals, and we define addition to be coordinate-wise addition, and the multiplication to be defined like this. Okay, then, then it becomes a field. This is a multiplicative identity, and this is a additive identity. And for a become for a a real number, this mapping is a field isomorphism. So then we can view R as a subset of C. Now we define I to be this. Then we have A B can be written as A plus B I. Right? And we have I squared is equal to negative one with this formula. Alright. Now since we're gonna just get through some basic properties of complex numbers. So since we have this equality, right, then here we get a formula for the multiplicative inverse of a complex number. And for z equal to a plus bi, we denote a as the real part and b is the imaginary part. And the norm or the or the magnitude is defined to be like this. This is a Pythagorean theorem, right? And the conjugate is defined to be like this. And here's a note. C is a metric space with D is the Euclidean metric. Okay? So we can just view them as R squared. Don't like the and equipped it with a special multiplication. Okay. Now, this what might be useful, this formula. Okay, so in polar form, right, we can have x is r cos theta and y is r sine theta, then with r equals the magnitude of z, and theta is defined to be the argument of z. And we have abbreviation, which is c theta. Now, speaking of that, we have an Euler's formula. So z could be written as r times e to the i theta, where r is the magnitude and theta is the argument. So here's a short proof. You should know like the Taylor's formula, right? So ez is defined to be like this, and written out like this, and then it turns out rearranged, we come to this, okay? So if z is to, we just put r in front, so it becomes z. So we're good. Okay, now we're gonna define some some lines, and complex plane. So for a is a complex plane, b is non-zero. We define a line. So a is a is a point and complex plane, and b is a, a direction vector. So the entire lines could be look like this. Right? So A plus T B, where T is in real, is a line in C. This set is a line in C, and we note that for any point in L, we have this. And if Z has this property, we let T be equal to this, then we have Z is equal to A plus T B, which means that Z is, belongs to L. But with these two arguments, we can have that the set L is equal to this set. Now, let's just picture this set. Okay, let's just help. Let's just picture this set with this become positive. To picture this, we will first let A equal to zero, then H zero is equal to this set. Now, we have Z and B. We express them in polar form. In division, we have the mod, uh, the MOS theorem. Right, then z is in the set if and only if this is greater than zero. Right, imaginary part is the sign part, and this happens when when this is true, we have this is true. Well, then we can picture it as this, right? This is beta and this is beta plus pi, right? All of those those have it's like h zero. 
and for plus a we just we just do some translation so okay now it comes to a important notion and complex so we have we have a extended plane to be the one extended plane so it is represented at a unit sphere and r3 so this is the extended plane so we put let's just look at this okay so this is the complex plane and this sphere is the extended complex plane and okay so here we have z we have n is the north pole we have n is the north pole so as a unit sphere we have this so n is the north pole zero zero one and we identify c with so it's basically this point at uh, this plane right so this cuts s along the equator okay now for z and for n we connect them and there will be exactly one intersection on the sphere and we denote it as z so z is the corresponding point on s okay now <coughs> So let's just read this. Okay, if it's greater than one, so here, then this is on the north. If it's inside, then we, when we link through, right, intersections couldn't be on the south. And if z goes to infinity, so it gets far, far, far away, then the, right, then the z is gonna approach to n, right? So. We identify n and the point this and this so it can right so for entire complex plane right we have a corresponding z and we attach one more point the north pole right we have all the points on the sphere can be corresponded to one point in the complex plane except for the north pole Right. Well, the north pole, right, is corresponding with the point infinity. Oh, uh, Wu Chong Yuan Dian, right? The point that's very far away, infinitely far away. Now, let's just let's just do some discovery. We just so we have a line, and R three. We want to discover. Like this notion, what we're we gonna do? How do we represent? How do we represent a point on this given this? And how do you represent a point on a sphere? No, how do we represent a point on a complex plane given a corresponding point in terms of the coordinates, right? So we have a line through Z and N can be expressed like this, okay? And the intersection with S is when all the coordinates right, have this property. And here is some simple algebra. Just, some sim just algebra is high school math. right? And we just plug it back. And notice that 2x and 2y, we have a special way to write them. And this is a high school algebra. Okay. Now, if we given this point on the sphere, the corresponding point on the complex plane, we first we set t equals to x3 then z can be written as this okay now let's just keep going <coughs> for z and w in complex plane we define the line this is the line between w and z it's defined to be this set so t is from 0 to 1 tw plus 1 minus tz and we define a polygon from a to b to be a union of lines okay where z1 z w n is b and so it can be written as this so w w this w this is z right we can do like this some so each time we have a line right we have our points here so this is a polygon 
and Theron 2.3. Okay, here's a Theron. An open set G open and complex point is connected if and only if any two points there is a polygon from A to B that lies entirely inside G. Open set is connected. Okay? So I assume you you know some I know, assume you know uh, general topology and single variable analysis. You need to learn them to start this course, okay? Well, then the proof is that, okay, so for, for this direction, we assume that, we assume this statement is true. For any two points, we have a polygon lies entirely, and we want to show that G is connected. Well, suppose for a condition, suppose for a contradiction that G is not connected. So for A, B, open and closed, non-empty, intersection is empty, we pick A equal to A, B belongs to B. Then, by our hypothesis, we know that there exists a polygon such that it lies entirely in B. And we know that for this polygon, there exists a line such that one endpoint is A and another endpoint is in B. There exists a line. So one of the components of the polygon must have one endpoint in A and another in B. Well, if all lines has two endpoints in A, then B is one endpoint of the lines, but B is in B. And notice that they are disjoint, so we have got a contradiction, right? <coughs> so let's just first consider when P was to AB. Well, this is like we just consider so if we have. So if we have, this is A, and this is B, right? We do some lines, like something like this, no. So we have A, we have B, right? We have lines here and there. This is A, this is B. And we know that this, for this line, right? So we just consider when the polygon happens to be like this. Let's just start this case. Let's just, let's just say like, for these two points, right? For these two points, this is like the polygons, right? Now, we let S to be the set S from zero to one such that points on lines such that we have the corresponding point on the line as an A. And T is T from zero to one such that the corresponding point of T lies in B. And we have they are disjoint, right? Because A and B are disjoint. And the union of S and T is equal to zero and one. Right? Because the union of A and B is G. And zero is in S, one is in T because A B, right? And if we can show that S T are both open, we get a contradiction, right? Then which means that this interval is separable. But this interval is connected by general topology. So let's just show that S is open. Pick S, right? We have a pick S belongs to this set, then we have the corresponding point is in A. Well, because A is open, then we have, so here's a diagram. This is the corresponding point. There is a neighborhood of this point, right? And the point is in A. Well, for all those, we take a map back, right? It becomes it could be like this, something like this, right? Then, which means that there is a neighborhood of S is in S. Well, S is open. So similarly, T is open, right? As I said, it's geometric, right? So which means that G is connected. We get a contradiction. Now, for this, we assume that G to be connected, and we want to show that our hypo like our our uh, condition for any two points, blah, 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 right? Okay, so fix A belongs to G, and A to be the set in G such that there exists a polygon such that it lies in G. We want to show that A is equal to G, right? This is what we want to show. And we show that A is both open and closed because G is connected by general topology, right? <coughs> Now, A is open. We first 
we let v plus a. Now, p is gonna be like this, right? Because p plus a, we have a polygon and lies entirely in g. But since g is open, right? This is the first time we use that open set g. When you use g as open, the condition, then which means that, right? B is in A, B is in G, right? Then we have an neighborhood, we have a ball, epsilon ball lies in G. Now, if, sorry, for points in this ball, we have the line between them is in the ball, right? It belongs to G. Well, with this being said, if we adjoint this line to the given polygon, if we join this line to the polygon, then this is again in G because we have P and G and this is in G. Then their union is also in G. Which means that, well, for any two points, right? For any points in this epsilon ball, we have a polygon from A to Z, right? Z is in G. Well, this means that we have this. Well, look what we have, right? Okay, now we show that A is closed. We just show that the complement is open. So for Z equals to this, we know that because G is open, right? No matter what, you're always in G. Then G is open, we have uh, this. If, we, if this has intersection with A, this ball is not disjoint with A. Then, since B is in A, and B is in the ball, right? For this argument, right, you take a look, we can get us another, another polygon that lies entirely in G, well, which means that Z is in A. But Z is defined to be not in A, so we get a contradiction, which means that A is closed. This means that this means that this is not open, right? So, here we finished the proof. And the corollary states that open connected points in G, blah, 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 blah. But, so all these are the same, are the same as the theorem, but we have extra addition, condition, which is that it's made up of line segments parallel to either the real or imaginary axis right so it's like gonna be like like the zigzagging so as an approved above we define a to be a more special set which means that b is such that it is a polygon lies in highland g and all segments parallel to real or imaginary axis so we just add more condition we're restricting and we repeat the argument above we repeat like the exact same the exact same but, but, for this, this line segment might not parallel the axis, right? But let's look at diagram. We don't do this. We do something like this, right? So for S A, this, we have these two lines. Well, this is again in, in the ball. Then we can just repeat our thing. We can just keep going, okay? No, we have finished the proof. I'm sorry, I forgot to say this. I finished the proof. Okay. Now, some more topological definitions. A subset of a metric space is component if it's connected and is the maximal connected set. So if any subset is connected, we can't have this set uh, strictly contains D. Is the maximum connected set. So theorem 2.7 it states that oh so we have these two things. So each point is contained in a component and distinct components are disjoint. So each point is in a component. So will D be a collection of connected subsets such that it contains this? Since this set is in the collection, right? So this set is not empty. And 
this union is also connected because they have a common point x naught. Now, if D is connected, and if it contains C, then we know that first, then, which means that D is, is in C, right? Oops, D is in NC. Oh, so we have these two conditions, so C is equal to D, which means that C is a component. So there is a component that contains X naught. And secondly, is that distinct components are disjoint. So if they don't equal to each other, their components suppose for a contradiction that they have an intersection, then it is connected. Then as you can see, right, we get a contradiction. Okay, theorem 2.9, it states that components are only open and only countable, where in C, the components are open and only countable number of them. Well, is a component of G, which means that since G is open, right? So we have a ball, and this is connected because they have a common point X naught, right? Well, this means that we have this, so C is open, right? So I gotta see, we have a, a ball, so C is open. Now, We'll kind of show that there are only countable many of them, right? So here's like a abstract part. So it has to define the set of all complex numbers such that the real and imagined parts are rational and it lies in G. They're rationals. Well, because S is countable, right? And each component is open. Then which means that each component must contain a point in S. Think about it because each component is open, right? So for each, so there's a component C. If a point is open, so it has a ball. Well, each ball it must contain some rational points, right? It must contain some rational points. It must. Well, which means that you cannot have a component that contains no rational points. So. It must be countable. It cannot be accountable. It cannot be more than countable, right? Okay, let's just, after this, let's just run through some, uh, oh, one thing I need to mention, all these contents are like general topology and the single variable calculus, like the root and stuff. So we just skip them. Mm, where is it? To me, about theorem, just like general topology, and wait, wait, wait. Okay, so uniform convergence. Yes, uniform convergence. We have so is is continuous, and if each f n they uniform converge to f, then this f is still continuous, provided that each of them are continuous. And here's a where's rest m test. We're gonna use it later. So each u n is a complex valid function such that we have this each of them is bounded. Suppose that this series converges, then this is uniformly convergent. So if they are bounded and the bound and the bound is converge and the bound converges, then this converges uniformly. And the proof, I'll just omit it because we did the same thing in, um, in Rudin. Okay, so this concludes this lecture. We just do some, some preparation for our theory. And thank you for today.